and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, and I will always sing of when your love me. Oh, sing that again over the mountains and the sea. Your river runs with love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, and I will always sing when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. And I will always sing of when your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love oh I could sing I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Hey man, you may be seated, everyone. Welcome to Riverside this morning. We're glad you're here. We hope that you're already. If you haven't felt it, I hope that you know that Jesus is here as well. His spirit is here. He's going to move amongst us. He's going to, he's going to open our hearts for what he has for us today. If we will, are willing to open our hearts for him. I'm glad that you're here. We're going to be praying for our service here in just a moment. Uh, we are going to uh, continue this year. We're praying each week. Our prayer focus is one of our churches here in the Merrimack Valley. We're lifting them up and asking God to do something special for them this, this week as we join together. This week our prayer focus is Christ is the Answer Church. Isn't that a great name for a church? Christ is the Answer Church in North, North Chelmsford, Mass. So would you join me in praying for them as well as for our service? Father, I lift up Christ as the Answer Church. I pray for their, their pastors. I pray for their people. I pray for uh, uh, success in the service. Success not measured with numbers, but success measured with changed lives. Success measured with people drawn closer to you and equipped and well able to go out and meet the needs of that North Chelmsford community, to share the gospel of truth, to share that gospel of love with those around them, their neighbors, their friends. And God, I pray the same for us here at Riverside. I ask that, Lord, by your spirit, you would speak to us that there would be changed lives here today. I ask, Lord, by your spirit, we would grow closer to you and that when we leave this place, we'll be equipped to make a difference here in the Merrimack Valley. God, in Methuen and in Lawrence and in Lowell and Drake and Tewksbury and all our surrounding communities that we spread to after we leave these doors, God, because of today's service, let us go with greater confidence, greater knowledge, and a greater power in the spirit because you are with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Why don't you get up and greet someone, welcome them today, tell them hello, go over and shake their hand, and say welcome to Riverside Assembly today.
Praise Him, you heavens and all that's above. Praise Him, you angels and heavenly hosts. Let the whole earth praise Him. Praise Him, the sun, moon, and bright shining star. Praise Him, you heavens and waters and sky. Let the
Show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from the heart. Filling every part of our brains. That's our prayer this morning. Lord, won't you open up the heavens? Oh, we want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our brains. Sing it one more time. Sing. Oh, open up the heavens. Lord, we want to see you oh, open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. God, let your spirit flow like a mighty river to us today. God, your heart to our heart, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. Great is thy faithfulness. 
faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. And morning by morning, new mercies I say. faithfulness to be with God. You're always here, always there for us, oh God. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Oh, 
And I know that there are hearts that are here this morning and you're hurting. I can tell you that we're surrounded by the very presence of God. And he surrounds us not... He surrounds us to be with us. I mean, yes, he's going to give us gifts. He's going to bring us comfort. He's going to bring us strength. He's going to bring us healing, all those things. But he surrounds us just to be with us, just because he loves us. And he says, oh, I'm going to hang out with the people at Riverside today. I'm going to be with Dan. I'm going to be with Robert. I want to be with Maria. I want to be with Maggie. I want to be with, with, with Ruth. I want to be with every one of you. God is saying, I just... I want to spend some time with you today. I want to surround your heart. We're going to move to our time of prayer here in just a moment, but I want to encourage you. Whether you come down to the altar and kneel or whether you sit in your pew and, 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 and open up your heart to him, know that he is surrounding us in this place. He offers us peace. He offers us his presence. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come down to be ready for people who have needs in their hearts and their lives. Prayer team, would you come down? And as Don leads us in some music here in just a moment, you may be seated, everybody, but as Don leads us in uh, uh, some songs in just a moment, if you have a need in your heart, something that has been uh, a burden to you, come on down. Somebody will pray with you. If you just want to spend time at the altar and kneel here, you're welcome to do that as well. 
But as Don leads us, let's, let's continue in this attitude of, of recognition of the presence of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence today. I know I've felt it in my heart, God. I know in my spirit we have been speaking to each other. And that's miraculous, God. Help me not to forget how miraculous it is just that your presence is here and that you speak to our hearts. God, I ask that you would bring peace and comfort and joy and strength to us, not just now, but uh, throughout this week, Lord. Help us to be filled with your spirit. Help us to be used in the gifts of your spirit it's for the benefit of our brothers and sisters in Christ and those outside who need you so much. Lord, I pray for those needs that have been represented here at the altar today, those that are sitting at home and, and watching online. I ask, Lord, that your hand would continue to be in motion to bring about the answer, the healing, the job, the mended relationship, God, the strength that is needed for us to be overcomers by your power and not ours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, welcome, everybody, again. We're glad that you're here today. Hope that you are uh, enjoying God's presence. I want to especially welcome anybody who might be here with us for the first time today. We have a, a little uh, packet to put in your hand. So if you're here today and you're here for the first time, you haven't been to uh, uh, Riverside before, would you just raise your hand so we can put one of these packets in your hand? Anybody here with us today for the very first time? Yes? No? All right. Well, listen, we've got these new packets. Invite someone to church and tell them, you know what the best thing about our church? We've got new packets. I encourage you guys, invite someone to church. Use, use one of the little red prayer cards that we have out there to start a conversation, to uh, uh, invite someone, a friend, a family, who you know needs, needs to be at church, needs to come and, and feel what we've been feeling today. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, bring someone along and bring them to church. I want to uh, just mention a, a couple of things, a couple of changes you might have noticed. Uh, we have taken the ropes off the pews. It's uh, uh, been a long time coming, but uh, uh, we're, uh, it's, uh, um, I'll tell you one of the things, I think I mentioned that, uh, that, that was great about the ropes is it spread everybody out and looked like we had more people. But that's okay. Look, we don't need the ropes anymore. Um, we have taken them down. Look, if something happens in the future, we can always put them back up. But for now, we feel things are safe enough that we've, we've taken the ropes off. We uh, are relaxing that six-foot uh, rule. Also, you may have noticed that the prayer team did not have uh, masks on during the prayer time. However, all the prayer team members had masks in their pockets. And if you come up for prayer and you uh, are wearing a mask, then they will put on a mask as well. Uh, so that's going to be up to you. If you want them to be putting on a mask, then uh, either ask them to or just wear a mask yourself, and they'll be happy to put on a mask for you. It's time for us to continue our worship in our tithes and our offerings. This is our opportunity to say, God, we love you, and let me open up my pocket to show you that I love you and that I'm thankful to you and that you are doing good things here at Riverside and this is my church and I am happy to be part of it and I'm happy to be part of something bigger than just me, just myself. I am part of the body of Christ and we give in, in reflection of that. So as the uh, ushers come forward and they're going to uh, be up here, let's pray. Father, I pray for our offering, Lord. God, every coin, every bill, every check that goes into that offering, God, I ask that you would use it for the purposes of your kingdom. God, this is not uh, a gift to a building. This is not a gift to a people, uh, a person. God, this is a gift of love to you. But through that gift, God, through that gift, Lord, it'll bless our building. Through that gift, God, it will bless the people here, and we will be able to worship you uh, in spirit and in truth, continuing on and on. In the name of Jesus, we pray and bless this offering. 
Amen. Amen. As we begin, come on up, drop your offering. side assembly of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Have some announcements. Tuesday night, upper prayer room. Come join us at seven o'clock. Uh, we stand together in love, lifting each other's needs to God's throne. Uh, we have powerful testimonies of what God is doing in each other's lives and just answered prayer every Tuesday when we come. We have answered prayer. So uh, if you guys want to come out on Tuesday at 7 and feel the move of God, please join us. We worship for preschoolers and toddlers is available today. To be part of this wonderful ministry, children must be registered to Kid Check, which is out at the Welcome Center, uh, see bulletin for more info. Women's ministry meets Sundays at 9.15. Uh, Sister Narda, is that in on Zoom and in the class? Yes, so it's in the education wing and also available on Zoom. Uh, men's ministry, Bible study, meets on Mondays at 6.30 on Zoom only. Uh, we also have a men's breakfast coming up this Saturday. It's going to be a testimonial breakfast. I encourage all men to come to see what the Spirit of the Lord is doing in our lives. Um, if I don't have your information and you're interested in the men's ministries events after service today, I'll be up at the welcome desk, and you just give me your name and phone number, and I'll send out messages to you so you have those that information. Um, 
we also have uh, adult Sunday school uh, at 9.15 on Sundays in the fellowship hall. Uh, we are currently studying the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, encourage everyone to come to Sunday school, Bible study, so encouraging. Uh, September 28th will be a special service at Riverside. It will be a pay it down Sunday, and we will discuss how we will face the walls in our lives that keep us back from achieving all God has planned for us. October 16th is our annual mission service with special guests, Tom and Rachel Pito, missionaries to Vanuto, Vanuatu, excuse me. <laughs> Come and hear what God has accomplished through our gifts to these missionaries. A Riverside prayer team is ready to pray for you. Email prayer at riversideag.com or text to 978-873-PRAY, pray. And also that ministry is also so many answered prayers. Uh, if you have any prayer needs, uh, call that number and we have so many prayer warriors praying for you guys. Amen. And we're, now we're going to dismiss our children. And we're going to pray for our children. But before we pray, I just want to read a word from God. Jesus blesses little children. Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this day and this opportunity that you give us to bless our children with your word and to show them who you are and the love that you have for us and for them. Lord, I pray for the teachers, Lord, the children, that your Holy Spirit touch every heart and draw them closer and nearer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Children, you're dismissed. Children, have a good time at Children's Church. A wonderful, wonderful time. I love it how uh, when you hear pause at the country of our missionaries, all my Wednesday night crew shouted out, Vanuatu! <laughs> they know, they know. We've had uh, the Pitos on us, uh, with us Wednesday nights uh, a few times. We're excited to be able to see them uh, again. You know that Riverside Assembly of God has been in existence for 80 years. This year is our 80th anniversary. We had a big celebration on the 75th, and, uh, and so that was great. But I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that Riverside, we've been around for 80 years. How many of you are 80 or over? Raise your hand. My mom and dad, and that's about it. All right, well, that's all right, you know, hey. For the rest of you, Riverside is older than you. Uh, but uh, uh, we're going to continue on, should Jesus tarry, for another 80 years and, and beyond. I'm not going to be around for another 80 years, but, uh, for, but, uh, but should Jesus uh, not yet return, this church is going to continue to be a light to the Merrimack Valley. Um, it's good to have my parents uh, uh, with us, and, and thank you for those who've been praying for them, and, uh, and that uh, uh, we're glad too that they have found. We've loved li having them live with us uh, in our house the last couple of months. They have found a, uh, a place for themselves to live up in, in New Hampshire, and we're uh, grateful that God has answered that prayer. Um, but we've, it's been a great blessing, and I hope that you uh, say hello to them at some point and 
and uh, start to get to know them as well. My, da- my mom and dad, Ruth and Otis Stanley. Uh, did you know that my name is also Otis Stanley? Some of you knew that. My name is Otis Daniel Stanley Jr. I've gone my whole life uh, by Dan um, or, or Danny, and, uh, and so, but uh, um, I as well am an Otis. And I'll start this morning by telling you about another Otis, Carrie Otis. Carrie Otis was a supermodel. And at 17, the age of 17, she signed a modeling contract. And at 18, she became famous by appearing on the cover of the French version of Elle magazine. And she shot to stardom. Uh, She was soon one of the most in-demand models in the world. She was featured in in multiple national advertising campaigns. She was featured in movies. She was dating Hollywood stars. She was earning, and and this is back in the 90s, she was earning $20,000 a day as a model. But there was a dark side to her stardom. In order to maintain her pencil-thin modeling figure, Carrie was abusing her body. Diet pills and laxatives and binging and purging, these were part of her routine to uh, keep her in that same shape. Eventually, it was heroin and cocaine. That became part of her lifestyle as well. Soon her body broke down and her mind broke down as well. And Carrie was checked into a mental institution and she was treated for her drug addiction and her eating disorders. And as is often the case, sometimes, uh, well, sometimes it doesn't work, but in the case of Carrie Otis, it did work. After she was released, she really committed to changing her life. She began eating normally. She began abstaining from all drugs and all alcohol. Now, one of the results was that she went from a size 2 to a size 12. But she was healthy, and she was happy, and she had found the place in her life where she wanted to be. And she became a a spokesperson for numerous charities, including a charity that brought food and clothing uh, to those who were starving in third world countries. And on her 32nd birthday, she was with a group of people distributing clothes and toys to orphanages in the country of Nepal. And after she came home from the trip, a reporter was interviewing her about her trip and about her modeling career. And the reporter asked, in all your life, when did you feel the most beautiful? And Carrie said very quickly, when I was traveling through the Himalayas in dirty clothes, dirty hair, hadn't had a shower in a week, and was giving kids clothes, that's when I felt like the most beautiful woman and the woman that I've always aspired to be. The world judges beauty on the outside, when in reality, it's the outside that can be deceiving. Everybody thought Carrie had it all, uh, everything under control, but on the the inside, there were great problems, because it's what's on the inside that counts. We're studying the book of Revelation, Earth's final chapter. And last time we saw a call for people to be prepared for the coming of Jesus, and we saw how people preferred darkness to light. Today we're going to begin looking at chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. So if you want to turn there, put your finger in that chapter, that's where we're going to be. In chapter 17, we're going to see a new character introduced into John's vision of the times of the end. We're going to see people tempted by surface beauty. And we're going to see them fall for a cheap counterfeit. Let's pray. Father, as we look here at your word, at your holy scripture, God, I ask that through the book of Revelation, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to take what we're learning and apply it to our lives, so that, God, we see the deep beauty of you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're moving right along. We're making our way through the prophetic book of Revelation. And what we've seen so far is a vision that, John, that, that Jesus is giving to John the Revelator. 
He's showing him what's going to happen in the final chapter of earth. Jesus asked John to record what he was seeing. I want you to write down this vision, John, Jesus said, so that you can share it with these seven churches in Asia Minor. That's uh, what we would call modern-day Turkey today. They're going through trials and tribulations and, and persecution. I want you to write this down for them so that they can see it. And what God is showing in this vision is that final chapter of the history of planet Earth. And the final chapters that we've seen so far includes judgment upon the rebellious and the wicked, but it also includes the glory of the followers of Jesus who have persevered through the pattern of tribulation that Christians face. So the message to these seven churches in the book of Revelation is to persevere. Persevere through difficult times. Resist temptation. And you, if you persevere, will experience God's glory. Look what happens, what Jesus is saying through this vision, to the believers and the final chapter. They have persevered and they will experience, and they experience God's glory. And he's saying to the seven churches, you guys, you're going through temptation. You're going through, through persecution. You're going through tribulation. Persevere. Keep the course and you will receive God's glory to you. Well, that message is going to be the same to us, we who read and study the book of Revelation. In fact, if you remember, in the first chapter of Revelation, there was a promise of a blessing to those who read the book of Revelation. There's a promised blessing to those of us who hear and read this book. And at least part of that blessing is the encouragement that we receive to persevere, to keep going. Now, Revelation is a book of predictive prophecy, and one of the rules of predictive prophecy that we know is that it can be very symbolic, and there are things that we're not going to completely understand until it comes to pass. But the underlying message that we see in the book of Revelation, even though some of the details we might not understand, the underlying message is still clear and it is still useful for us because it is God's word. Revelation is useful to us for correction and instruction and encouragement in our journey as disciples of Jesus, as we persevere and depend on his strength. Last time we finished chapter 16, showing God's cycle of judgment represented by seven angels pouring out seven golden bowls that were filled with plagues and destruction. And as we begin chapter 17, John is approached by one of these seven angels who had the bowls. Turn with me, Revelation chapter 17, the first two verses. This is what it says. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Now, the great prostitute is obviously a symbolic character, much as we saw previously in the book. But she's contrasted against the woman who represented Israel and the church back in chapter 12. If you remember that woman, she was shown as a woman of life, a, a symbol of purity, the symbol who had given birth to Jesus, the nation of Israel giving birth to Jesus, and then representing the church afterwards. Whereas the prostitute in chapter 17 is a woman of temptation. She's a woman of vice. She says, the Bible says that she's sitting by many waters. Think of sitting by many waters as having many ports of call. In other words, the kings of the earth have easy access to this prostitute. All the earth seems tempted by her. The angel then brings John to where he can look at her. Verse 3. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. So from this description and from later in the chapter as well, we see that her demonic transportation is the Antichrist, the beast, who we saw in the previous chapter. It is a sign to us 
that of her evil and destructive intent beneath hidden beneath this tempting exterior and the exterior of the this great prostitute is beautifully tempting look at the first part of verse 4 it says the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. So from the outside, this prostitute looks beautiful, looks regal even, as if, as if she was a queen. And she even holds a cup of gold. Look at the second part of verse 4. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. So she holds this golden cup. But what is in the golden cup? It's an abomination. It's something filthy. The word abomination, it, it, it means, in English, the detestable. But the Greek word for denomination uh, in that verse has the root meaning of something that stinks. Something that stinks with a foul odor. So it's remarkable that something with an odor that foul is tempting all the men and women of the world, is tempting the kings of this world to commit adultery with her. When something smells that foul, but people are looking at the exterior. They're looking at the golden cup and holding their nose to what's inside. The prostitute's identity is available for John to see. Verses uh, 5 and the first part of verse 6 says, The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. So this prostitute represents Babylon. Now, last time, a couple of weeks ago, in the previous chapter in 16, we saw that the city of Babylon was destroyed under the judgment of God. So what's going on here? How can this... We just saw Babylon destroyed. Well, here's what I think. If you'll remember, when we began studying Revelation, I said not everything goes in chronological order. So I think what's possible here is John is given this part of the vision to explain what the city of Babylon represents. So here, John, you've seen the city of Babylon destroyed. Now let me show you a symbol so that you can understand what Babylon represents. But for John, he's still a little bit clueless. Second part of verse 6 says, When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Now the word astonished here is ethemasa in Greek, and it means to be amazed and make you wonder, what is going on? Like if you see something and say, what is that? I don't understand. You're astonished. And that's what John is feeling right now as he sees this Beautifully dressed prostitute with a, a cup full of golden cup full of filth and the name of Babylon written on her head. Now I'm sure that kind of astonishment has happened to John a lot during this this uh, uh, this vision of the Book of Revelation. But this time, as he's astonished and confused, the response from the angel is a little bit different. Look at chapter uh, of chapter 17, verse seven. Then the angel said to me, "Why are you astonished?" I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. I'm sorry, you're going to do what now? You're going to explain it to me? That's been a pretty rare thing in this vision. There's been a whole lot of astonishment, but not a lot of explanation. But obviously, this symbolism is somehow something that is so important that John... Plus, we, as the audience of the book of Revelation, needs to know who this person is. So God allows this explanation for the purpose of John's understanding and for our understanding as well. So I'm not going to have time today to go into the complete explanation that the angel gives uh, of the prostitute who is Babylon. uh, It's quite lengthy, and we'll look at that on the first Sunday in October. But let me get at least to the next verse, which is a bit of a preview. The angel begins with an explanation of the beast that the prostitute Babylon is sitting on. Verse 8, the angel in his explanation says, The beast which you saw once was, now is not, 
and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. So that's the explanation. Um, what if I don't quite understand the explanation? Maybe John was hoping for something simple, something plain, like uh, uh, the beast is the son of Caesar, or something that would be easy to understand. But rather than give an identity, the angel describes a beast that is a cheap counterfeit of Jesus. Do you remember what God said in the first chapter of Revelation? It was in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The beast that the prostitute sits astride once was, now is not, and yet will come. Now, it's possible that this is a description of the fatal wound that the beast received and then recovered from. Uh, the not is now could also represent a time of peace for Christians before the final persecution comes. People are guessing different things. But what we absolutely know is that those who do not follow Christ, those who are in rebellion to Christ, they are astonished by the beast. The same Greek word for astonished here in this verse is the same word that John expressed when he was, saw part of the vision. They are amazed. They are wondering what is going on with this counterfeit Messiah. Now this false Messiah is going to promise the tempting allure of the prostitute who rides him. He will appeal to humankind's worst instincts. And they will accept this counterfeit Christ, believing that this Messiah it, he requires a whole lot less than the real Messiah. This Messiah whole, requires a whole lot less than Jesus does. When in fact, the Antichrist is enslaving them through their own base desires. But the beast and the prostitute who rides him, they're going to face the judgment that they deserve. So what lessons can we take from this part of chapter 17, from what we've heard today? How can we take this rather strange part of the vision and take that home and unpack it and apply it to our lives? What we said at the beginning is true. Even through symbolic uh, prophecy, God will speak to our hearts and God will let us know what he wants us to know. So God, if your heart has been open, I know that the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you. But let me just share with you the things that God spoke to me as I was studying this passage of Scripture. The first lesson I'm taking away is this. People are tempted by what's on the surface. The vision that Jesus is giving John, it shifts to this new character, this, this great prostitute of Babylon. She's dressed in beautiful robes. She's dripping with expensive-looking jewelry, and in her hand is a golden cup. But this cup is filled with abomination. The root word, which means something that reeks, a foul odor that, that turns your stomach. And yet, the people of earth are still intoxicated by the filth of her cup. Still, they are drawn to the wine of her adulteries, and they drank from the disgusting putrescence she offered because it was in a cup made out of gold. Now, we might say, that's stupid. That's foolish. Why partake of something so repugnant just because it's in a pre pretty container? When I take out a carton of milk from the fridge, I often smell it first. Anybody smell your milk first? You smell it, you go, if it stinks, I don't drink it. If, it's, if I just be, oh, I'm going to pour it in a pretty cup. Then it'll be fine. No. You smell and you're like, this is awful. Why would people drink from this, this, this filth in her cup just because the cup is made of gold? But this is the common response of men and women all over the world. This is the common way that our enemy, the devil, tempts 
humanity because nothing that the devil has to offer you, nothing that the enemy offers is has deep beauty or peace or life in it. He doesn't have anything good to offer. All he can offer you is repulsiveness, is conflict, is death. But by making it tempting, in order to make it tempting, the enemy wraps it in a covering of temporary pleasure. He wraps it in something that looks shiny. He wraps it in something that says, hey, you'll enjoy this. And that surface glitter is enough for the world to hold its nose, to check its gag reflex, and to drink from the cup of sin. The ways of this world are broken. All the world can offer you are the basest of man's desires. The Apostle John put it this way in 1 John 2.16. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world doesn't offer you anything that the Father has. The world only offers you the things that tempt man, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are the basic things that tempt mankind. They offer temporary pleasure, but these things lead to eternal death. So I encourage you, Church of Jesus Christ, do not be like the world. Do not fall for the lies of the enemy. See what lies behind the surface, beneath the surface. And when the enemy offers, it may be something glittery, but I tell you, it is filth. When God, what God offers may not always shine on the outside, but it brings life. Let me give you an example. In the Lord of the Rings, In the book, The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo is on a dangerous journey. And Gandalf sends a man named Strider to help him. Now, Strider is a ranger, which means he lives a a rough life in the wilderness, probably doesn't shower, probably doesn't bathe, he smells, he doesn't shave. At first, when Frodo sees Strider, he's distrustful of him because he looks pretty rough, looks pretty frightening. But eventually, Frodo sees beneath the surface. And he realizes he's not frightened in a way that the enemy would frighten him. And this is what he says. I think one of the spies would, well, seem fairer and feel fouler, if you understand. I see, laughed Strider. I look foul and feel fair. Is that it? And then he says this, all that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. All that's gold does not necessarily glitter. And there are things that glitter that are not gold. What Jesus offers us is life everlasting. It may not bring you temporary pleasure, but it will bring you to take part in God's eternal glory. Choose based on reality not what it looks like on the surface. Here's a second lesson I've taken away. God explains what needs to be explained. God explains what needs to be explained. John is, he's astonished again at his, uh, at this part of the vision, at the appearance of, of, of this prostitute and the beast that she rides. What in the world is this? Here's another thing I don't quite understand, and I think by this time he's probably getting used to wondering what's going on. But this time, there's something a little different. This time, an angel says, here, John, let me explain this to you. Now, the explanation he gives is still a little mysterious, at least so far, how how far we've read. But in this circumstance, God makes sure John gets an explanation. Why? Why is it in this circumstance God makes sure John gets an explanation? Why in all the symbolism and mystery of the book of Revelation does God stop here and explain the symbolism of this prostitute? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted to. Because it was his will to do so. That's what I know to be absolutely true. I could make guesses at why this uh, explanation is so important, but the thing that I know for sure is that God had a reason for explaining this to John. 
Now, have you ever noticed that God doesn't explain his reasons all the time? He, he's great on where, he's great on how, but he often chooses not to reveal the why. Has that ever frustrated you? It's frustrated me. I could be going through something in the middle of some trial, some difficult situation, and I fairly scream out to God, why? Why this? Why now? Why this trouble? Why at this point in time? Sometimes I eventually get an answer. Most times I don't. This is a guess, but I think most times I wouldn't understand the answer. That my little finite brain could not wrap itself around the complexity of God's eternal plans. So you know what I have to do? I have to trust him. It's, it's not easy sometimes. Maybe a lot of times it's not easy. But it's still my best option. Trusting God is still my best option when I don't get an explanation. But here is something that does make it a little easier for me to trust. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Look, I may not know why God is doing what he's doing, but I know he's doing it for our good. I may not understand the why of why I'm going through this, but I know I'm going through this for my good. I don't deserve good, but he's a good God, and he takes care of me. So you might get the explanation you're looking for, but there's a good chance you won't. There's a good chance that you won't understand the crazy path that you're walking. But whether you get the explanation or not. In either case, I encourage you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your, under, on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Here's a third lesson that I'm, I'm taking home with me. The world accepts a counterfeit if it's easier. The Antichrist is a cheap imitation of Jesus. And Satan designed things that way on purpose. The enemy made a beast that is miraculous. The enemy made a beast that is charismatic. The enemy made a beast that was wounded and, and, and became alive again. The description of the Antichrist in, Re in Revelation 17 mimics the description of Jesus in Revelation 1. And the world is drawn to the Antichrist in the final chapter of humanity, partly because serving the Antichrist is easier than serving Jesus Christ. It really doesn't take much sacrifice to serve the Antichrist. You just have to get a mark on your right hand or forehead. But they can, people who follow the Antichrist can still partake in all the temporary sinfulness of this world, all that this world offers. They can still embrace the greed, the lust, the pride, the prejudice that this world offers to them. And they can take it to heart. But in the end, they will find out that they were not the masters of their own lives. Sin has been their master. And the payment of sin is death. The spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well today. People are still willing to settle for a cheap counterfeit so long as it's easy. As long as it's easier than following Jesus. Because being a Jesus follower isn't easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. It takes commitment. It takes sacrifice. And it takes trust in someone whom we have not seen. But we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the hard work. We are empowered by God's Spirit who dwells within us to do the things that are hard, to be a follower of Jesus. And listen, don't be, in fo don't be fooled into embracing the title of Christian without the sacrifice. Because some people love to call themselves a Christian, and they like Jesus. They think, hey, he was, he was a good teacher. They like him, but they aren't willing to make the sacrifice. Don't be fooled. One time, Peter the disciple, the Peter the disciple, he tried to convince Jesus that if he shouldn't have to suffer, 
in order to follow the Father's will. He said, Jesus, you, far, you shouldn't have to suffer to follow the Father's will. And Jesus rebuked Peter. And this is what he said next, Mark 8, 34 through 35. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, he doesn't just use the word cross because it's something heavy. Think of what the word cross was. It was a method of execution. He says to the disciples, if you're going to be my disciple, then you've got to deny yourself. Take up your mode of death and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus is saying, it's not going to be easy, guys. You need to deny, your, deny yourself. You need to be, be willing to accept death. You need to surrender your life. But if you do that, if you lose your life for the purpose of me and the gospel, then you will save it. Don't settle for the cheap counterfeit. Give your whole life over to Jesus. Be a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus, and be willing to take up your cross. And he will empower you to carry that burden. Because although he said you've got to pick up your cross, he also said that he will make that burden light. He said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You can pick up the cross because the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Father, I ask that uh, by your word today, you will confront us with our need for commitment to you. That you will confront us with following your reality rather than things which just bring us temporary pleasure. And that through that commitment, we will experience the life of glory you have for us. If you're here today uh, and you're uh, in the pews and You've never given your life to Jesus. One, everybody, keep your heads down, your eyes closed for a moment. If you've never given your life to Jesus and you say, I, I need to, I've, I've liked Jesus, I've been a fan, but I haven't been a follower. If that's you today, I want to pray for you. And we're going to ask uh, uh, that uh, if, you're, if you feel like that's you, would you raise your hand and just say, yeah, pastor, that's me, would you? Would you pray for me? Anybody says, yeah, I need, I need to give my life. Thank you. You can put that hand down. Anybody else says, yeah, I, I need that commitment. And maybe for some of you, you're, you're, you're saying, hey, I, I'm trying, but I'm just not there yet. I'm still slipping so much into the temptation that the world offers. If that's you, listen, we're going to pray for you as well. Because it is, you can't overcome it through your own strength. So stop trying. Instead, trust in God. Remember that his presence is with you to empower you to overcome. Heavenly Father, God, we as a body, we as Riverside, commit to you once again our lives. Let us be used by you to encourage others, to show others, Lord, the need for a true Savior. Help us to see beyond the surface, God, and to see the reality of your beauty and love, and to follow after you, no matter what it costs. We depend on your strength, because we can't do it on our own. Remind us of that throughout this week. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. May God richly bless you this week. May he walk with you. I know he's going to walk with you, but may you realize that he's there. Thank you for coming, everybody. You're dismissed. Have a great, great week.